join me in our opening prayer, which is prayed in your book. Renew your church, Lord, your people in this time. Save us from cheap words and self deception in your service. In the power of your spirit, transform us and shape us out of your cross. Our opening hymn is on 334, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. You may stand as you are comfortable as we sing together. Sweet, Sweet Spirit, number 334. <laughs> to the clouds. Your righteousness is like a mighty mountain. Your judgments are like a great deed. O Lord, humans and animals be saved. O God, how precious is your steadfast love. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river. For with you is the fountain of life, in your light do we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your salvation to the other life. Amen. Please be seated. What are you thankful for this morning? I'm very grateful for our great grandson taking off the cross and on his on the road to recover. For those that, that missed that, um, Andrew. Who is Joe and Al's great grandson, David and Missy's grandson, and Philip and Amber's son? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, he's uh, been battling COVID, was in the hospital two days, three days. Okay. And, uh, was that COVID and pneumonia? COVID and pneumonia. He's only one year old. We didn't want to continue praying. Yes. Yes. Lots of prayer today. That's oh. everything for you. I have a uh, prayer to, to Joy and that some of our uh, ones that we have asked for prayer for are improving and others have fallen into the same place. So we've got family on both sides of all the meetings. I'd like to have prayer to give my family. My niece, uh, Dana Angel, died on the 3rd. Well, that's an easy prayers. I know that there are a lot of people that are sick right now with COVID and with other things. Uh, I mentioned this in my announcement yesterday that I personally know more people right now that have COVID than I've known at once this whole time. I know a colleague of mine, uh, his stepmother just passed away from COVID. 
We definitely want to keep all those in our prayers. There have been a lot of deaths that have been hitting close to home in this community lately. We want all those families in our prayers, the family of Nancy Godfrey, the family of Gary Fox. Uh, continue to pray for uh, the Marks family. What else needs our prayers? Betty Lou, we want to pray for her family. Yes, ma'am. And my sister, Susan, may be suffering from depression. She definitely needs prayers. Absolutely. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. As always, I will lead this prayer and encourage you to pray along with me and during times of quiet if you feel so glad to lift aloud any names or situations that are on your heart. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, it is good to be here this morning. It is good to come into your presence once again with one another, seeing one another's faces and hearing one another's voices lifted up and praised. We are thankful for this opportunity. We are thankful for this people that are, that is Center Church, that we can be called by your name to be a part of your name. <coughs> Lord, it is not something that we have earned. It's not something that we deserve. We are here by your grace and mercy. We are given a seat at your table by grace and mercy. And so as we enter into this time of worship, we do so with thankfulness and we do so with confession, admitting our wrongdoing to you, admitting our evil deeds, our sins, the ways that we have rebelled against you, the ways that we have failed to love those who you have called us to love, the ways that we have served ourselves. Pray that by your grace we may be free not only from the guilt of our sin, but from the power of it. That all wickedness may be rooted out from us. That we may rise up in righteousness and build up your kingdom in this place. Pray for all those who are gathered in whatever way they are gathered in this morning. And you may bless them with your mercy, with your kindness, and with your presence. Pray for the ministries of this church, of all churches, and we may all work together hand in hand for your glory, your kingdom's sake. We pray for those who are hurting today, who lift aloud those who are ill and body, those who are undergoing treatments, those who are facing surgery, those who are in recovery, those who are told they will not be. We pray for the mentally ill. For the bipolar and the schizophrenic, for the anxious and the depressed, for the borderline and so many others. We pray for the broken hearts, those who are filled with grief and sorrow, those who are alone and isolated. We ask that you heal bodies, minds, and hearts. We ask that you heal our relationships with one another. Teach us to give forgiveness as freely and easily as you. Heal our homes and families and our friendships. Heal our church and our community. Heal our state, our nation, and our world. For all in need of healing this day, we pray. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers and for your work in our lives to answer. You've given us so much. You've given us so many good things that we take for granted. Even though our love failed, your love has remained steadfast. You have proven your love to us by sending your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again, that we may have life abundantly with you. So we praise you for all these good things, and we join our voices together as your children, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Now, it is good to be back together worshiping in person once again after the last couple of Sundays. But as always, I remind you that 
when we can't gather in person to work for the church still on board or constantly at work as part of this community, part of this world. It takes all of us working together. We do that by giving to God our gifts, which we're actually going to be talking about today in the sermon. That includes our time, that includes our abilities, that includes our energy, that includes our financial gifts as well. It takes all of these things to continue the work of this church. And so as our ushers come forward, I encourage you to give out of God's abundance in your life, to give to the good work that God is doing in and through this church.
1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts of the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services of the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities for the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you have called us in here and gathered us together. You have begun speaking to us. Now enable us to hear, that we may be transformed not only by the hearing, but also by the doing of this world. And through our lives, this world may be transformed. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. I have noticed in my life that there are a lot of very confident people in this world who have no right to be as confident as they are. <laughs> we all seen these people. We all know these people. People out there who are just very sure of themselves, very sure of their own abilities very sure of their own opinions, despite all evidence to the contrary. You've probably worked with these people before. I will always remember this one lady at an office I worked at who was very sure that not only was she doing her job great, she was very sure that you weren't doing your job great, but she was here to she was very confident that she could make everything in that office better. She went out on medical leave. We all breathed a sigh of relief. She was very, very confident, in spite of all evidence to the contrary. Confidence is a funny thing. It is. Where, where does confidence? come from, presumably it comes from simply being able to do something and do it well. As you learn how to do something, whether it's cook or fix a car or play a musical instrument or whatever it is, as you improve in that skill, supposedly you should gain confidence. And yet there are people out there that seem completely confident in skills that they've never even tried before just in who they themselves are. They just know for a fact that they can do it all great. I've also noticed that there are people on the other end of the spectrum. You've got on one side people that are confident with no reason. You also have over here people that are not confident with no reason. I see it all the time. People that I know are very capable and able and yet they lack confidence. They don't see their own abilities. They don't see their own skills. In every church I've ever been a part of, whether as a church member or as a pastor, there have been people that are on both sides of that, but I really think there's more on the lack of confidence. And I'm sure that there's some history behind there. Maybe people haven't gotten the encouragement they need. I don't know, but it seems like a lot of churches have people sitting there that are very capable, but don't see that in themselves. Today's passage from 1 Corinthians, I hope, is familiar to you. I say that in part because this is one of the first passages I ever preached at this church five and a half years ago, and I'm sure you remember that sermon very well. 
Assuming that maybe you weren't here that day, this passage comes from this section in 1 Corinthians that makes up chapters 11, 12, and then 13 of that book, where Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, basically explaining, look, this is how you be church. This is what you will do as a church, as a group of people who are committed to Christ or, and are gathered around Christ's cross with one another. This is what you will do. This is how you be church. And this specific section that I read earlier has this idea of spiritual gifts. And that is something that, that comes up a lot in churches because it is important to the life of the church that the church members, that those who are following Christ, understand spiritual gifts. Y'all have heard me preach on this, even if you don't remember it. Y'all have heard me preach on this before. You've probably attended some sort of a Bible study or a Sunday school lesson where they talk about this. Maybe you've even read a book. This idea is very prevalent in our churches. In fact, while I was writing this very sermon, I capitalized spiritual gifts every single time. It tells us just one of those things that stands out. Spiritual gifts. We're all supposed to have them. We're all supposed to understand them and use them. And yet, every pastor I know, including myself, has often looked out at their congregation and thought, why aren't they using their gifts? If we study them and talked about them and read about them and have this understanding of spiritual gifts, why aren't y'all using them? What is standing between you and fulfilling this purpose that God has in your life? I've been thinking about this lately. I've had extra time to think about this lately because this was supposed to be a sermon three weeks ago. <laughs> I think that there are two big reasons why we as Bible-believing Christians, we as church-going believers, don't practice, don't use our spiritual gifts. And the first is comparison. Comparing ourselves to others is a terrible habit that we just can't seem to get out of. We compare ourselves to others and we either end up putting ourselves down low or putting ourselves up too high, one or the other. And we tend to, to have this hierarchy of gifts and abilities in our mind. Which ones are good and which ones aren't really that great. And for some reason, we, we put the, the gifts that can be used up here in front of everybody else. We put those high up on the list. Those are great gifts. And we put the gifts that kind of get done behind the scenes low on the list. And that makes no sense at all. But we do it anyway. We just say, oh, well, because I am not up front, I am not doing a good job or I can't do it. We elevate some of these things. I get told by y'all on a fairly regular basis, I wish I could play guitar like you. I wish I could sing like you. And I appreciate that. But you know what I wish? I wish I could play guitar like my buddy Josh. Because he's good. I wish I could sing like him too. Because man, he's got a great voice. I wish I could play piano like my friend Juan. She puts her heart and soul to it. I swear sometimes she finishes and that piano is just smoking. <laughs> You know what comparing does? We all compare ourselves to other people. It just puts us down. It makes us wish that we were better. Now, it can have a good effect. You know, if I wanted to, I could play as good as Josh. I'd have to put in the same amount of time that he does. I don't put in that time. Therefore, he's better than me. But if I compare myself and I want to be like that and I commit to it, I can become better. But oftentimes, that comparison does not make us commit ourselves to improving, it makes us commit ourselves to not doing that at all. I can't play guitar as well as Josh, therefore what? I'm not going to play at all. And see, I, I would say that we commit ourselves to the sidelines, but really we don't commit ourselves to the sidelines, we resign ourselves to the sidelines. We say, well, I'm not good enough, I don't have that ability, therefore I can't do anything at all. Or sometimes we look at what we can do and look at what other people do and we think to ourselves, well, I'm so good at doing this right here that you cannot do this right here. 
That happens sometimes in church. We think to ourselves, look, I am the only one that's capable of X. And therefore, nobody else can do it. And really, it's not, honestly, it's not that we're better at doing X. It's that that person over there does it differently. And if they don't do it the same way that I am, then they are wrong. And that's why I load the dishwasher at my house. <laughs> Bring that in our churches. I do it this way, and any other way is wrong. Therefore, you cannot serve in this church. You cannot use your gifts in this church because your gifts don't look exactly like mine. Comparison. Really not a good or helpful thing. I think there's one other reason why we don't use our gifts. That reason is fear. I mean, a couple of things by that. One, we're afraid of embarrassing ourselves. I mean, we're afraid to get up here where I am and have people look at you. We're afraid that if we try it and we mess it up, that people are going to see how bad of a job we did. So we just don't try at all. But I think even bigger than that is that we're scared of the very idea of spiritual gifts. It seems kind of intimidating. You read through that, that list that Paul writes there in 1 Corinthians 12, and it seems complicated. Sometimes it seems downright I believe in some of these things. Miracles? Healing, prophecy, wisdom, and knowledge, it sounds kind of like something out of a fantasy novel, out of a comic book. Like you sign up for this church stuff, and all of a sudden you're expected to be the Justice League. You can't be a miracle worker, we think. We read that list, and we see all these things, and okay, where in this list of gifts do I fit? We've even developed a tool to help us with this, something called a spiritual gifts assessment. Some of y'all have done it before. We've done a spiritual gifts assessment. Some of you have. If you're not familiar, a spiritual gifts assessment is similar to those uh, quizzes that you might find in a magazine. We just ask you a whole bunch of questions about yourself. Now, it's better than those quizzes that you find in magazines. But basically, it's asking you questions about your life and about your experience at church and your experience in doing the work of church. And then at the end, after you've answered all the questions, you kind of add up your score and you look at it. You've got a score sheet over here, you got a chart over here, and you look at the parents and say, okay, well, what gifts does this say I have? That's a tool. It's a useful tool, but it can also be uh, less than helpful. It can be kind of a backwards way of doing things. Because you can take that and you can get this assessment and say, okay, well, according to this assessment, I have the gift of miracles. All right. Yes, I got to go find a miracle. That's kind of like if I took a test and said, well, according to this test, I have the ability to fly. Yes, I better go jump off a building. It's not how it's supposed to work. So we get overwhelmed. We get kind of scared. And so instead of trying our gifts, we, once again, sit on the sidelines. So let's get rid of comparison. Let's get rid of fear. Let's get rid of complication. Let's take a different approach to spiritual gifts. The first thing that I want you to understand is this. You are gifted. You are gifted. God has made you very unique. God has given you abilities. God has given you an outlook on this world that is yours. There's nobody else here that can do what you do the way that you can. You are gifted. God wants you to be who he made you to be. I also want you to understand this. You've been using your gifts for years without even realizing that you're using your gifts. 
Scripture tells us that the Spirit activates our gifts. And we kind of tend to, to build that up and think that we're out walking around, we're in church, we're doing churchy stuff, and all of a sudden, whack, the Spirit smacks us on the head, and boom, we're just lit up. We got to go do these spiritual things. Maybe that happens every once in a while, but I find that God is much more so than that most of the time. The Spirit activates within our gifts. That doesn't mean that the Spirit swoops down and makes you start doing these things. That means that as you are doing these things, as you are using your gifts, your abilities, your talents, your skills, as you are using these gifts for God, God's presence is in there using them for good. Making good come about. Consider this. I am a pretty good public speaker. I have no problem standing in front of any number of folks and rambling on and on and on about whatever subject is at hand. I can just talk and talk and talk and talk. I can tell you jokes. I can tell you stories. I can have you laughing one minute and crying the next, and I want to remind you of what I said about confidence earlier. <laughs> I'm a pretty good public speaker. It's a gift that I have, a talent I have, a skill I have, whatever you want to call it. But when I'm preaching, when I'm preaching, when I'm using this gift, this ability for God's kingdom, the Holy Spirit inhabits my gift. So if what you hear is not just Jared's words, Jared's thoughts, Jared's opinions. Hopefully, what you hear is the Holy Spirit speaking God's words through my words, and sometimes in spite of my words. And I always know when that has worked really well. Usually it's because I walk out thinking, man, I did a terrible job, and y'all actually compliment me instead of telling me how nice my shoes look. But I always know when the Spirit is speaking to you because sometimes you will come up to me and say, Pastor, you said that, 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 and it was exactly what I needed to hear. And I said, what the hell? Well, that's about the Spirit speaking. And sometimes while I'm speaking, I hear what I'm saying. I think, I did not mean to say that. Where did that come from? I wish I'd been that brilliant while I was writing this sermon. That's the Spirit working in my gift. In my the Holy Spirit activates our gifts not by suddenly enabling us to do them. That does happen from time to time. But for the most part, the Spirit activates our gifts by working through what we are doing. Whether that's standing up front and speaking and singing and any of these other things, or whether it's making a pot of soup or pound cake, or making phone calls, sending cards. Not everyone can do that. I'm terrible at making phone calls and sending cards. That's a gift. Or maybe you can fix things. There's all sorts of stuff that needs to be fixed, not just here at the church, but all over the place. There's a lot of folks that don't know how to fix things, but they don't have the money to fix things. God can use that for you. Maybe you can work in the garden. Maybe you can convince a kid to try vegetables for the first time. We all have abilities. We all have skills. And when we use these abilities, when we use these gifts in God's service, then God activates in those gifts. And uses those gifts, those services that we have to build up God's kingdom, to do good in this world. Our spiritual gifts are also not for our own personal benefit. We don't have these gifts so that we can prosper from it. Well, Scripture tells us right here that the Spirit manifests in our gifts for the common good common good. In other words, we are gifted so we can take care of each other. We are gifted so that we can look after each other, provide for one another's needs, and make sure that everyone is doing okay. This week I read about something called the Rule of 50. Have you ever heard of the Rule of 50 before? Very simple idea. Take a group of people. Take a group of people who are trying to accomplish something together. When that group gets to be too big, the group starts to fall apart. When that group gets to be too big, they don't all feel like they're contributing. 
They don't all feel like they're part of you. They don't all feel like they matter, and they don't feel like they need one another. And the size limit for that across human nature seems to be about 50. That's the rule of 50. Once the group gets over 50 in number, it doesn't hold together like it did. And they've studied this and they've traced this all the way back through history. They look back at our, our ancestors that were nomadic hunters and gatherers, and they tended to live in groups of 50. And even today, in modern times, we have teams. Well, when those teams, whatever game they're playing, get to be above 50, they start to fall apart. They have companies, and when those companies, when the employees grow to a number above 50, they don't all contribute like they do. That holds true for churches as well. And when I read this this week, and I considered Center Church, I thought to myself, we're the perfect size. <laughs> this is great news for us. This is great news for us because we are perfectly equipped to take care of each other, which is exactly what Paul said we are supposed to be doing. It takes all of us to make sure that none of us fall through the cracks. It takes all of us looking out not for our own interests, but looking out for the interests of one another. It takes all of us using these gifts that God has given to us to take care of each other. As I say every week, the pastor can't do it alone. It takes all of us, and we are perfectly equipped to do it. God has made sure that we are perfectly equipped to do it. So let's change this way that we've been viewing giftedness. Let's stop comparing ourselves to one another. Let's stop feeling intimidated by it all. Let's just do what God has equipped us to do. Take care of each other with all the unique gifts and abilities and Services that we can render to one another. In the unique way that God has made you, you can love everybody that's here with you. You have the ability to love everybody in this room right now because God made you that way. So let's let the Spirit be active in our common day to day lives, not walking around waiting for that moment where things come upon us in power, but just doing those mundane things that we know how to do. Letting God build up his kingdom, letting God build up this church through the way that we live our lives in the lives of each other. Let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for the gifts that you've given to each of us, the unique ways that we can serve you and care for one another. Help us to live together as your way. In such a way that no one is left out, no one is left behind, and everyone is here. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Our hymn of response this morning is number 593, Here I Am, Lord. You may stand to your comfort as you see, prepare ourselves for the ways of this week. Number 593. <laughs>
see this benediction. The Lord is leading you. It might be to a foreign place, or it might just be to Monday morning. Go wherever God leads and live the life that God intends you to live. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.